we are very pleased to have with us um, Mike and Gus from Eastern Indiana Works. They are valuable resources to the Wayne County community and the entire Eastern Indiana region. And they have some great information to share with our business community today. After today, um, we will be posting the link with the video recording for those who could not attend today or if you want to go back and listen to something afterward. So at that, we are going to um, ask those in the room to introduce themselves. I think that would be, um, it would be good for Mike and Gus to know who they're talking with and especially after our, um, our momentary hacking a few minutes ago, it'll be nice to know who all is with us. So um, I'll start, I'm Melissa Vance president and CEO of the chamber. And Jeff, let's pass it to you. Sure, thank you. Uh, Jeff Roth served in the Indiana Senate for uh, District 27, which carries about four or five of the, well, three of the counties, I think that you all, uh, that uh, the WIOA board represents. And so good to be here. Just, I had, I don't know how I had extra time this afternoon, not that I wouldn't, but it's interesting. Uh, I, my heart's in workforce development, so I appreciate the opportunity to participate and listen and see what's happening in the region. We enjoyed having you and Representative Barrett a couple weeks ago share with us, so I'm glad you could join us again. Stacia? I mute myself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stacia Viramale. I'm with Vista Investment Partners. I'm also on the Board of Directors for the Chamber as well. Okay. Roxy? Hi everyone, I'm Roxy Deer. I'm the Director of Professional Development for the Wayne County Chamber and I oversee HYPE Wayne County, which is the Unprofessional Development Organization. Great, and Tammy? You are muted, you'll have to unmute yourself. Got it, okay. I'm Tammy with All Rings Ice Cream. Good to have you, Tammy. Thank you. Valerie? Well, I'm Valerie Schaefer here with the EDC of Wayne County. Glad to be with you today, and thanks to Mike and um, Gus for joining us. Sarah? Good afternoon. Sarah Mitchell with the EDC of Wayne County as well. Looking forward to hearing from Mike and Gus. Great. And then we have Lisa on the phone. Yeah, hi, I'm Lisa Dollar. I work at Primex Plastics. I work in HR there as well as uh, serve as the chair of the Business Education Committee. Thanks for taking time out of your day, Lisa. And sure. we have Ed, a familiar, familiar one to us. You're muted, Ed. Sorry. Um, hi, I'm Ed. I'm the director of the Richmond UEA um, and a CCDC board member. Great. So, um, if you aren't if you aren't speaking, we are going to ask you to mute yourself just to minimize the noise. Um, and at that, at that, we will turn it over to Mike and Gus. Thank you, Melissa. Again, my name is Mike Rowell, not to be confused with the dirty jobs guy, which uh, oftentimes I get messages uh, never about picking up uh, any of uh, Mike Rowe's paychecks, but always uh, asking my opinion on, uh, on something to do with uh, employment and work. So that's always good. So uh, I'm privileged to serve as the president and CEO of Eastern Indiana Works. I've been in that position for nearly seven years. Prior to that, I led a manufacturing company in Bluffton, Indiana, that um, was able to um, transition uh, violent convicted felons back into uh, full-time meaningful employment. Um, and uh, we had a 73% retention rate uh, through that process. And then we called ourselves the launching pad and sent those individuals off to higher paying jobs from edge manufacturing and prior to that I was in economic development. I think I met Valerie during that time uh, 
and uh, and got to know a lot of you. Um, so I'm privileged to work with each of you and serve uh, the workforce board in that capacity. My role is primarily high level strategy um, and also resourcing uh, so that uh, we can create uh, great uh, new initiatives that will uh, enable people to flourish uh, in Eastern Indiana. So it's a nine county workforce board region and uh, I love every minute of every day and I love working with each of you. So uh, one of the privileges I have is I, I'm starting to hate him. This is an old joke I always use. I'm starting to hate Gus Lindy uh, because he's better looking, smarter, and he has a lot more money than I have. Uh, so you'll see that when he speaks when I finally give the floor up. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, introduce Gus. Ah, thanks, Mike. Uh, Gus Lindy, I'm the Executive Vice President of Workforce Strategy, and everything Mike said is absolutely false. I have no money and I have no looks. Um, I've been in workforce development for nearly 20 years um, at both the state and, and local level. Um, prior to my role with Eastern Air Works, and I've, I've worked with Eastern Air Works for about five years now. Um, I served as a director of oversight at the Department of Workforce Development. I was the president of operations for the Indianapolis Private Industry Council or Employee Indy, the Indianapolis Workforce Development Board. And most recently I've served as the one-stop operator, uh, contracted operator for 20 out of the 92 counties. So I had uh, uh, two different regions that I've, I've assisted in, in helping them partner all of the required partners in workforce development and agencies to, to bring the best services we can uh, in our state. So with that, I think uh, our agenda today is to talk to you all a little bit about some of our services, especially our telecoach program, um, how we've been doing things over the last eight weeks or so. Uh, with the stay in order and uh, the shuttering of our offices. A um, little bit about our reopening plan and maybe some initiatives we have coming down the pike. Does that sound about right, Mike? It does, Gus, and uh, thank you. Before we uh, uh, get to the agenda items, just wanted to uh, reiterate that Eastern Indiana Works is not a government agency, it's a private sector 501c3. Um, and, and so oftentimes, uh, and, and we do partner with the Department of Workforce Development and uh, also work very closely with Senator Rotz and uh, Representative Barrett and, and others to um, cultivate a, a, a world-class workforce for our region. So, but there's a lot of misunderstanding about regional workforce development boards. Um, particularly when it comes to unemployment insurance, and we'll be glad to clarify that uh, during this time and uh, also answer any questions you may have. So thanks, Gus. Yeah. So that being said, like Mike said, we're, we're a nonprofit. Our piece of, of, of partnering and coordinating with all the state agencies and other community partners um, is really on the reemployment side, not the unemployment side. And so with that, um, one of the things we, we actually started launching this and piloting this end of last year and into, ju into January was our telecoaching program. Um, we've been doing it now for about five months. Um, the pandemic really escalated our our launch of this and uh and can and quick rollout of it and uh it's been fairly successful so far um basically all it is is simply serving clients via phone and video conferencing and while that sounds easy as we as we started this call off it's it's kind of hard to make the technology sometimes work and i think we've all learned that over the last seven or eight weeks um we use a, a, a very simple product. We use Microsoft Bookings um, to allow clients to go to our website at easternairworks.com, uh, click on the link, and they will get access to our coaches. Uh, Microsoft Bookings, we put all of our coaches' calendars in there, and we ask our staff to leave those spaces available that clients can, can book with them. And they will take a slot, and when our, our staff will then get a notification 
that uh, someone has asked to have a meeting with them and they will contact that person. And, and I think that's where the challenge gets in, in our rural slash um, we've got communities where we have some internet, good internet. We have a very rural area. And so that is probably our biggest challenge. We also have some skill challenges with some of our clients not being comfortable using video conferencing. So we originally had hoped to do more through video conferencing, but as this has evolved, um, we will serve them via phone and email or through video conferencing. It's always great to have a face-to-face -face interaction um, but at the end of the day, we want to be able to give clients the information and services and, and uh, options that best fit their needs. And so um, we do anything from basic resume help. Um, we love doing the video chat with people and helping them get ready for interviews. Um, we go through some of our paperwork and actually have put a few folks through uh, some online training opportunities through our E6 program. Uh, our E6 program is for um, opioid recovery and, and um, work opportunities. And so we've helped some folks uh, go down that path and or it also is to help people get into that uh, industry cluster. How do we get into recovery coaching and things like that? So we've done, uh, uh, I think, three or four folks in the last two weeks into peer recovery online um, training. So we've got a vendor that's been able to do that. So we can do all those things. And, and we've actually, we're ready whenever we can get back to doing work experience with clients. We, we do work experience and other training opportunities. There's a, a plethora of services and we don't have enough time today to kind of go through all of those. Um, but work experience is one of our, our biggest ones where for anywhere from four to eight weeks, we put people to work with an employer and uh, we take the brunt of it. You know, all we ask an employer to do is give us feedback, you know, try them for four to eight weeks. We think you'll love them. And uh, if you do keep them, if you don't give us that feedback. And so we're hoping to get that back rolling once we kind of get away from the stay at home order and, and can get people back into the workplace. Um, so how successful has it been? I, I would tell you in the last eight weeks, our small but mighty uh, team from our, our contracted service provider, they have about 20, 25 or so staff. Uh, they have managed 20,000 calls with a, um, a capture rate of nearly 96%, 96, 97%. Um, they don't miss many calls. Um, and those that we missed, we have called them all back. So we, we've managed quite well. With all those calls, a lot of questions coming through to us for unemployment insurance. But uh, those who have other, other uh, needs, we have served them. So we have provided more than 700 clients informational level services. So they need a little help with a resume or they want to know where the jobs are right now or how to access job, the different job boards or what's the best job board. We've answered, we, we've served nearly 700, help them put them down that path. Um, we've actually enrolled a hunt, uh, just over now. Uh, this is last week's number. Um, so it's now just a little more than 100 clients into the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act, which is our, our largest funding stream. Um, that funding stream has has three paths: uh, general low income adults, um, those who've been, which we're, we have a high number right now of folks who've been dislocated through no fault of their own, um, put on unemployment insurance, or the youth population. So we have we have enrolled nearly 700, uh, or sorry, 100 people into that category, and that level of service gets into actual career counseling and individualized employment plan development. Um, you know, I would say those calls typically are anywhere from a half hour to an hour of really getting into your individualized needs. It's not just a, here's how you get an interview or here's where the jobs are, or uh, here's what the labor market looks like right now. Um, we've also, and so a number of these would be clients we served before the shut-in um, of our offices. We have placed more than 75 people into employment. I think it's actually 77 uh, this week, which is pretty good because there are still opportunities. And if you go to um, follow Eastern Air Works on Facebook or Twitter, um, you'll see we have job postings out there uh, about every other day for every county in our nine county region. So um, I, I share with your friends, uh, your colleagues, um, people you know who, who are out of work right now, there, there are opportunities and they're being posted out on social media through Eastern Area Works. Um, if they need our help, tell them to go to our website and, and uh, 
asked to, to schedule an appointment with one of our coaches. Um, exciting piece of today is we're hoping, uh, right now our plan is on Monday, the 18th, we're going to, uh, we've got a reopening plan we've been working on for the past four weeks and uh, we're looking to open our comprehensive office. Uh, East Area Works has one, what they call a comprehensive office uh, where all services are available um, from all of our partners. And that's out of Muncie, Indiana. That office will be opening five days uh, a week, eight to 4.30 come Monday with limited services. The only thing we're opening it up for is so people have access to computers. Uh, we're probably gonna have about four, to keep the social distancing, it's not a large office, keep social distancing. We'll have about uh, 14 or 15 computers, it looks like right now, available for people to, to schedule. We're also gonna be opening the um, Fayette County office in Connersville. Um, three days a week, um, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at this point. We share a space with a, another partner and that partner is not adhering to um, the requirement of wearing masks. So we're just gonna stay closed on those days so we don't have cross traffic issues. Um, so we're doing the, the best we can. Our other offices are located in Richmond, uh, Newcastle, and, and Rushville. Our Richmond office is in the Excel Center and currently they're shuttered until July 6th. Um, we're looking at opportunities uh, in the community and, and what we may do between now and then. Um, in Newcastle, we are in the um, Newcastle Library. They're looking to go curbside soon, so we're, we're starting to have some discussions on what that may look like and, and if we have some opportunities there. And, and partially because of the, the staffing it's going to require to keep things going we've had to we're going to keep our Rushville office closed for a little while longer because we're utilizing that staff in the other offices so um, at this point we've not had to, to furlough any staff we've we've used them either at home on the telecoaching process or we'll have a, a process to uh, to have them rotate in and out of the offices for for uh, services there um, the best the best way we can to keep those computers open open clean and available um, so the, again, this is a very rough, you know, still a, a fluid plan. Um, those offices will open on the 18th. We'll be looking at June 1st, whether we can get the one, either the Rushville or the, uh, the Henry County office open. And then we'll be looking at two to three weeks later, um, the opposite office opening. And then worst case scenario in Richmond will be, um, will be uh, July 6th at the Excel Center. Um, but again, Anybody in any community, um, even if all they have is their telephone, can call our offices and we will, we will talk with them or we will schedule them um, for an appointment and, and meet their needs the best we can, uh, whether we have a physical office or we don't have a physical office. I think that's been the, the great piece about what we've done over the last four or five years. Um, our mobile team is shuttered a little bit. We're using them in these the, as we start doing the reopen plan, but we have four or five staff that go around to different communities, especially communities we don't have uh, offices in. Um, and we serve, serve the public out of libraries, out of employers, offices, um, faith-based organizations, um, and the like. So uh, anywhere that there's a, place people congregate and have an employment need, um, let us know. We'll, we'll find a solution for them. And I think that's the big piece about Eastern Area Works over the last four or five years. We want to be solution oriented. It's not about where we have an office or, or what we do in that office or what organizations are in it. Tell us what the need is and let's find a solution for you. So, um, as we reopen this office, we are going to be requiring all clients to wear masks, all staff to wear masks. Um, we're following all the CDC C guidelines um, on that. Um, and if you didn't know a lot about Eastern Air Works, I, I had that up. Um, yeah, there it is. Uh, Eastern Air Works serves uh, roughly about 1,500 to 2,000 people a year. Right now, we're tracking um, with our little bit of blip. We're gonna fall just shy of 2,000 this year. We're probably gonna track in about 1,750 people in our nine county region uh, served each year. And that's been in a good economy. Uh, we expect those numbers to go up dramatically once we get all the offices open and, and depending on where uh, the unemployment rate stays. 
Uh, hopefully it goes down quickly and people all get back to work, but if not, we're there for them, uh, serve them and whatever their needs are. With that being said, we're closely tracking, I'll kind of shift into some of our, our new initiatives. Um, our big initiatives have been, how do we serve everywhere in the community? Um, but we're also looking at, and, and Mike's alluded to it, we're, we're constantly looking at funding opportunities. Um, right now, at the start of the, uh, the pandemic, um, the Department of Labor has opened up a little bit of disaster recovery funds for dislocated workers. Um, they, they have a pot of money for emergency dislocated worker events, um, and they have opened that up. We're in phase one of that right now. Um, the first phase was for disaster recovery, and the disaster recovery had to be into sanitation or humanitarian uh, projects. Only the state could go after that funding, and then they're rolling that out to workforce boards. Um, that's still in progress. Um, the state was awarded 1.6 million. We're not sure what we're going to get for our region, um, whether they're going to straight line, divide that up equally, or if it's going to be based on based on population uh, and census data. Uh, but as we get more of that, the thought right now, most of what the state's planning has been around has been on the humanitarian side on how we assist getting people temporary employment to help food banks and other basic human need um, solutions. So more to come on that front. They are also, we're working on with a number of regions, the second phase of that, which is uh, of that disaster recovery funding, emergency funding, which is employment recovery. Uh, the employment recovery um, is a, a larger pot um, and we're looking at that a little closer. Um, it's unlike the first batch, which is for the disaster component, um, that probably would be like a six month project. This could be a year or two long project. And so um, I think they said Department of Labor, well, there's a few things going on. Um, Department of Labor, I think has nearly 400 million right now. I think they're leveraging some other project funds. Um, I think Indiana as a whole for all the workforce boards, we're looking at going after nearly $20 million probably a million or so, a million, million and a half each region. A um, couple of the more urban areas will probably have a little bit larger funding. Um, that will be just to get people into um, industries that have been highly impacted by the pandemic. So for our region, um, that would be manufacturing, somewhat healthcare, um, components of healthcare have been impacted, um, warehousing, logistics, retail, food accommodation, I think are the four or five that we've identified to start with um, and we'll be looking at that again we're, we're just we're continually getting information in um, the one piece we've had is as you see we've had five offices it's been very nimble last four or five years um, ever since the last stimulus package sort of ended um, there was last week um, information provided that there is a proposal out there for a 15 billion dollar workforce funding bill um, it's called the Relaunching America's Workforce Act um, that would provide some much needed funding to um, our organization. But while you see 15 billion, there are a lot of components here that go to other organizations. Um, there's a couple billion in there for community college and industry partnership grants, uh, some reentry components at about a third of a billion. Um, Native American programs, migrant seasonal farm workers. Uh, so probably only about half of that will go to to your workforce boards uh, at best. Uh, I'll be honest with you, probably closer to 40% by the time state holdbacks are, are made and things like that. But uh, we'll be looking at that. To how do we also use that funding if it, if it passes through and it comes forward? Um, it's not to supplement what we do, it's to continue to simulate. So it doesn't give us a lot of funding to expand staff, um, a whole lot of staff. It will be more funding to how do we get people into work. So we'll probably be looking at heavier options for work experience and on the job training opportunities um, and things to, of that such, uh, of that sort. Um, yes, if I don't, if you don't mind, I. I want to interject a question since you're on that topic right now. Yeah. Um, in the 2008 recession, there was a time where um, there was some stimulus that was helping 
individuals who didn't have degree completion be able to go back and get their degree um, or certificate or certification? Um, do you anticipate that some of these grant dollars would be used in that way? Or, or what are you thinking is going to be the actual use for that? I, I do. I think right now we're trying to be as nimble as we can. Uh, the money can always be used for occupational skills training, degree completion, as long as people meet eligibility. But we have three or four, five pathways to meet eligibility. Um, and I think this pandemic will, will easily make many people eligible. Uh, because I know right now we have the next level jobs that helps folks that don't have an associate's degree um, to complete uh, training or an associate's degree, but I just wondered if there might be some availability for those who have an associate's degree but want to move on to a bachelor's degree program, especially when you're talking about um, healthcare and potentially some logistics management you know that might require a higher degree level yeah I, I believe that all that will be on the table um they they mirrored this off of the act of 2008 uh 2008 and 2009 um i think the big difference i saw is language around uh eligibility includes folks who've been affected by covid whether you were affected and that's no this is pretty early in the process. Um, it's still in committee in the House, and I'm not sure exactly where it's at in the Senate. It's a bicameral um, proposal, so both sides are trying to push this through, um, but it does look like there'll be more, multiple paths, not, nor not just the normal eligibility of low-income individuals and standard dislocated individuals, but looking at there may be some eligibility for those affected by by COVID directly or, or indirectly in their family. But yes, I think from what I've read so far, all options of training are on the table. So um, it's really heavy, not just the base, as I started and told you, we start 700 people with just basic information. It's This is really written for intensive level services and training level services. So on the job training, occupational skills, training and retraining, um, work experiences. Um, you know, I think that's, and any combination of the, of that. So I think any kind of customized process where we do a little bit of occupational classroom training with some hands-on training, all that will go and be in play, including apprenticeships. Apprenticeships is a, is a hot topic right now. So that, that would also include that. Right. Um, I think the only thing that we're still trying to find out, there's been some questions on is what about incumbent workers? So, cause that's, that's a fine area. A person was laid off from a job and then they were brought back. Well, were they, a are they eligible as a dislocated worker or are they now an incumbent worker? Cause they got their job back, but they still have been affected. And how do, how do we do that? So we have a lot of questions nationally on that front, but we'll keep working on it. Sure. Um, any other questions? That that's the big funding pieces right now. We're also looking at what's collaboratively, hap collaboratively happening out there in the philanthropic arena with workforce, and how do we assist communities putting proposals together? And is there workforce information or or labor force data that is needed? We're here to help you with all of those items as well. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Mike, but uh, you know I think. We're trying to take a broad swath and broad look at how we serve the communities, not just with what funding do we bring in, but how do we collaborate and work as partners to to uh, help communities bring funding into the community. Sure, and uh, you know our uh, objective as a board of directors is to fulfill the federal law, which is called the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act of 2014, um, and um, by that be a one-stop shop just a one stop for all things workforce development in the region so um you know we worked very hard on our messaging uh eastern indiana works was carefully selected by the board of directors as an organizational organizational name it's a dba our our parent company is not eastern indiana works 
the corporation is Alliance for Strategic Growth, but that sounded too much like economic development. Didn't sound like we were staying in our swim lane, so the board decided to shift gears, implement Eastern Indiana Works to simple, uh, uh, be symbolic for, uh, to the world, actually, that if you live in Eastern Indiana, you work and you work hard and you work well. So uh, it would help our economic developers. We, uh, from our perspective, um, an attraction, retention, uh, et cetera. And, uh, but we wanna be about all things workforce development for all organizations in Eastern Indiana. Can you guys talk a minute about um, what you, I know you talked about some training and things like that, but how, you know, we have Primex on the line, for example, if, if they were looking to fill some positions, how would you go about vetting some candidates that might be good to send their direction or to do some of this on the job training, not to speak for you, Lisa, um, but, you know, some of our local manufacturers, I'm just trying to identify the best way to work with your organization and then also protecting the employer a little bit on the vetting side. Do you do any of that? Yeah. Oh, I mean, okay. I wasn't sure if you were gonna speak Mike or me. I thought I saw you getting ready to. Um, yeah, we, we do some of that. We haven't, some workforce boards get into actually doing pre-screening. We haven't dabbled into that arena, uh, but we do collect um, applications, resumes. We have the India Crew Connect, the job board. We can put the job posting there and and vet and and bring um, pockets of, of clients, you know, at least some light screening. Um, the system sort of does the screening for us on that front. But we have an employer engagement team, and that employer engagement team really goes in and tries to find the right solution for the company. So all the methods I just mentioned, whether it's just collecting applications or um, if there's assessment testing that they would like or proprietary assessment testing that they use, we try to set that up in that way. Same thing with the work experiences. You know, some some organizations want to build a apprenticeship program where they, they really have people who have um, some gravitas in, in that credentialing and, and their their training process. Um, others want, you know, more of the work experience. They'd like to know, know the person before they 100% commit. And, and those, the, that program, uh, just to give a little bit more, the work experience program, that's, uh, those folks are hired through our service provider for the first eight weeks. So the employer, you know, reviews those helps in the review process and understand yeah, I'd like to try this person um, but they go on our our service providers payroll for up to eight weeks and at the end of it all we ask for from an employer is what how did they do you know and if they say we love them we want them that's a home run um, but if we can just get a hit from it and someone goes, hey, they're great, but they need this, that, or the other. Sometimes it may be that they need some occupational certification. Great. What if we get them that and bring them back to you? Do you want them? We'll do that. So That's awesome. I'm not trying to hedge a little, but it really is a unique situation for each employer, what works best for them and the client. You know, uh, we want to make sure that, that we're, we want to be match.com for workforce development. <laughs> About how many employers in Wayne County are you currently working with um, as far as placement? Oh, good question. I, I don't have Denny's worksheet in front of me right now. If I had to guess, or I think we, I think last time I spoke to our employer engagement person, we probably got anywhere from 30 to 50 in any given county. He's got a pretty robust list of employers um, in our system. Great. Is that about right, Mike? Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, work experience is wildly popular because, as Gus stated, the, the board of directors, those individuals are on the board payroll uh, for four to eight weeks. And um, it's a risk mitigation uh, for employers uh, at the hiring level. That's great. Are you all working with the high schools as well? We, we have a JAG program in six high schools right now. 
um, I, I should say five, we'll be in six in the fall. Um, we'll be in Richmond High School in the fall for our JAG program. That's our in-school program. Um, right. We have a little bit of funding for other in-school. The Workforce Innovation Act of 2014 really flipped the model. Um, and, and fortunately, Indiana has had a JAG program um, in place for a number of years. But it used to be the funding for youth was a 70-30 split, 70% 70 in school, 30% out of school. When the act was changed in 2014 and implemented in 2016, it shifted to 75% out of school, 25% in school. Um, and the caveat we continue to tell um, to uh, advocate for is that also includes college students in that college students okay. are in school. So it really has limited us on how we can serve um, serve folks in, in our communities in that are that are trying to to work on their education, especially that college student because we used to count those as out of school youth and right. uh, helping them. You know, we help them in a JAG program and get them to a point. And as we've we've said time and time again, it's great that we can get them to high school. Then they get to college and they've got all these large bills and and stressors and we sort of let them go and that's been i think the one miss in the last version of uh, of the act when it went from the workforce in uh, investment act to the workforce innovation act sure. so we're, we're continuing I, and i know there are people who are listening to that and they're they're working on it um, but that's that's been a little bit but we do have our jag programs and uh and we assist in any other way we can um in the other high schools we work with all the career centers um at least right. from an, an adult edge, uh, adult basic education, and and try to do a little bit of our youth funding in the in each of the career centers. One of the programs that the chamber has had the last few years um, through the business and education committee um, that Lisa leads and Roxy's our staff lead for. So either of you ladies, feel free to chime in. But um, we've been having job fairs in the high schools doing, working with junior achievement, doing some soft skill training. But we know that there's a large percentage of students that are graduating. They're not heading to um, an Ivy Tech or an IU East or other higher ed or um, post-secondary training. And the goal of placing them in a full-time position, preferably with benefits, to be able to help them get on their feet, sustain a family in the future. Um, we feel like that's a really good thing and it would play right into some of the work that you were doing. Yeah, it would. Yeah, we'd love to know more about that and how we can collaborate on that. Um, I see that Stacia had asked a question and so just, for um, the recording. I don't know if the recording shows the chat box or not. So she asked that, um, let's see, I used to be on the Hope House board, a homeless shelter and addiction recovery center for men. Do you currently partner with them at all? If not, is this something you would consider? And Mike, I see that you responded um, that you do partner with them. Yeah, I'm not sure which which ones you're with. Um, we we will absolutely partner with any and all of them. Um, I know we have some in and around the region. I'm not sure exactly um, which which counties we're in on any of those at this time. But um, we'd be happy to 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 talk more about that and and start looking at how as we bring our mobile team back on. Uh, adding sites for them and, and looking at that. Right. That'll be an area where we, if we're going to expand staff, we're probably going to expand staff in that arena uh, for telecoach and and uh, mobile mobile access. And then the next question is, what is the average cost to successfully place an employee? That is the cost to the organization. That is a, that's a good question from, I don't know if we've done an analysis on that of, of their time and effort. We really try to take the time and effort side of it off of their, off of their hands. Um, you know, from a WEX standpoint, 
we're paying that payroll for the first eight or 10 weeks. Hopefully we're taking quite a bit of cost off their plate. Mike, do you know, have we, I don't think we've done any kind of analysis on the average costs to place an employee or a VU. Yeah, not to my knowledge, we haven't done a cost benefit analysis, but um, the cost for the, um, the employer would be time spent with Vinny Cochran and the others from the employer engagement team. Um, the cost to the board of directors would involve the, the normal um, wage, any UI tax, any, anything like that um, that would be paid. So, uh, and that varies depending on what the wages are. So we like, uh, you know, the higher the wage, the better uh, from our perspective, because that means someone will prosper uh, and by God's grace, buy a house, uh, pay increasing tax in the community and also help um, help support uh, local businesses. Yeah, I, I would say on average, what is what does it cost us on a WEX? I, I want to say it's somewhere between three and four thousand a client for six six weeks or so. And again, that varies if it's a four or eight week, but the average is about six weeks, and and we try to keep them fairly high on the wage, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen dollars an hour. Or so. Um, like I said, it runs in that three to four thousand dollar range, um, sometimes a little higher um, than that. So that's a benefit to the company that that's wages that they're they're saving. Um, yeah, we've tried to calculate the benefit to the employers um, uh, of this process, and we have not been able to do that successfully. Uh, there's incredible benefit, as you know, as a Former manufacturer, uh, I can tell you the, the biggest upfront cost for me were was turnover. Uh, we didn't ruin product or materials. Um, we had high turnover costs. So uh, trying to alleviate that for the employer was a is a major goal. And Gus is very modest, but he uh, played a huge role in establishing this initiative. Um, and it's again been wildly popular. We we uh, basically spend uh, the allotted money, uh, the money allotted by the board, very quickly uh, because of employer demand. So, if you are on the call and you would like to um, ask a question at this time, you can either. Um, raise your hand or get our attention in some way, or you can type your question into the chat box. While we're waiting on that, I wanna um, have you all comment. I know this isn't your arena, but there's confusion or maybe even a little fear that we're hearing on the employer's side that, um, that we have people that have been laid off and when they when they go to call them back that they may decide to turn down their um, offer to come back because they feel like they can stay on unemployment and make more money with the six hundred dollar a week benefit that's currently out there we know that's going to end um, or they may just think you know, the unemployment benefit is enough for now, given their childcare costs or what have you. Can you um, put some of their minds to rest that unemployment doesn't cover people that have, have been offered to come back? Yeah, um, there's actually going to be a um, Facebook Live event through the Department of Workforce Development tomorrow. So I think the latest and greatest information will will come out tomorrow on their Face Live uh, Facebook Live event. And I think we have a link to that either on our website or on our social media um, for people to access that. Um, Josh Richardson's the uh, chief of staff for the Department of Workforce Development. I, I pulled an article that he he spoke on yesterday, I think it was out of the South Bend Tribune. Um, but his his comments is the same thing I've been hearing, is if someone's worried about going back to work, um, it's not a good idea if they just don't show up or don't go back to work. Um, if they're, 
if that job comes back and is opened up, people should generally return to work or they could risk losing their benefits is what he stated in that article. Um, if they face, you know, coming back even at reduced hours, they could possibly still qualify for partial benefits. I also went out and pulled um, on the Department of Workforce Development, they have COVID-19 frequently asked questions of employers and um, for individuals. And question 12 on the individual side says, if I decide to remain at home because of COVID-19 with no directive from a medical professional or my employer to do so, will I be eligible for unemployment insurance benefits? The answer DWD has, has documented, um, and so I can say that to this group, because again, we don't do unemployment insurance, is their answer is, in most cases, no. However, the facts of each circumstance are important. You can file and DWD will evaluate their claim. In essence, if a person refuses to go back to work, they're taking that risk of losing benefits. Um, also, later in, that's I think on, in, on question 12, later in there, um, what happens after I file? Question 24, after I file a claim, the uplink system shows I have an issue holding up my payments. What does that mean? Um, and it explains what happens if there's, there's a review that happens um, and every employer has the ability to dispute that, that claim. And it says the common issues that, that it lists all of the common issues that are, are possible. And I think it's the eighth or there's 12 different issues. I think it's the ninth one is work refusal. So if the employer says, hey, they refuse to work, the agency received information the claim was offered work and refused the offer by employment. That will stop, could stop their claim and could actually put them in an overpayment claim. Um, I also, as I've talked in, in DWD, Department of Workforce Development has said this number of times, is um, I always warn people, claimants especially, don't answer the questions that you're asked on your claim incorrectly because it could put you in a fraud situation, maybe intentionally, but if you don't answer them honestly, you could be, you, you will end up either in an overpayment situation, have to pay that funding back or depending on the amount and how long you did it, it could be considered fraud. So um, again, sure. I'm, I'm sort of regurgitating what's out there um, because we, we can't make determinations on claims. Um, that is all with Department of Workforce Development. All I can do is kind of point you to what, here's the commonly asked questions and commonly asked or uh, provided responses. Um, all benefits, are are, they're all individual. Um, but, you know, as Josh had, has guided us is, Indeed, and the part of the whole department has guided us is if you don't take that work opportunity, you are putting your benefits at risk. Great. Thank you for that clarification. I see Valerie has her hand raised. Valerie, we'll turn to you at this point. Thank you. Uh, my question is related to the unemployment rate. As the Department of Workforce Development releases their monthly reports, it's, you know, obviously significant significantly lagging by the time the reports come out for the previous month. So I'm just wondering if you all have access to any real-time data in terms of what the actual unemployment rate is, because just as more companies continue to lay off, I know that several other companies are starting to get back to work and call their employees back. So just wondering if, if you by chance have any access to what our um, unemployment rate might actually be at this time. Uh, great question, Valerie. Thank you. Um, as you know, the, it, it takes some time for the data to mature, um, and access to mature data is not um, available to my knowledge. Uh, the best we can do is access Burning Glass, uh, which is the, the highest end um, database that, that we can possibly uh, find. Uh, even that has some lag time to it. So um, the, the best that we can do is through our employer engagement team, working with you and your team to assess. Uh, and again, it's, it may be an anecdotal assessment, um, but assess the current uh, unemployment status in your community. Um, and it, unemployment rates, I would say the national rates probably uh, real unemployment, uh, the, all the, uh, 
the U numbers from three to, to nine are, pro it's probably 25% at this point, maybe 30. Um, so, but you won't hear that number because it's a U3 number typically out of the data set. Um, so anything that we do is to be taken with a grain of salt outside of, uh, you know, the data that has been matured, although it is a couple of months old probably, uh, that gives you a, a snapshot is where we were at at that point. So I've been checking the DWD site weekly and, you know, the best I can tell, the most recent number of new claims filed that they've released was as of April 25th. So if I take that number of new claims and add it to the number of continued claims, that the sum of that divided by our total labor force number, would that give me an accurate picture? That would put us right around 7%, which seems pretty low. Yeah. Yeah, the, that's, that would, it's, go, it's going to be low. Um, some of those numbers are not everybody files um and and honestly that data set we were shared with a couple weeks ago is lagging they're doing their best to give us some picture of what's out there but that number is lagging in fact a couple weeks ago if you had noticed they were two or three or four weeks behind um they they seem to be getting a, a better indicator at the state level but at the county level those numbers are are lagging just because the claims are, are lagging behind on their processing. So um, it's probably, it, it's at least double that percentage at this point. Um, yeah, as, as Mike said, it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, there are out there cause I've questioned the number of claims in our region. I think the claims number should be higher than what it is. Um, so I don't know if it's the processing of it. Um, Plus those initial claims, a number of those may get pulled out. Um, if they're denied, those don't necessarily mean they're going to end up being continuing claims. So, um, sure. it's, 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 it's a difficult game to, to figure out. As Mike said, we look at, there's a whole data set and we look at all of those and, um, you know, in some of the other counties we've talked to, some of them have surveyed, you know, their employers to say how many people are are out of work right now. And it's typically double, we're hearing double what the number of folks who filed unemployment claims in that community. So um, I won't tell you that's a good rule of thumb to use, but you know, if you're seeing X on, on unemployment, it's it's closer to double that right now from what I've I've been hearing. But again, that's anecdotal at best. Um, as Mike said, we're shooting in the dark here a little bit. There is a lag, and some of that lag is because the federal government has to to do their review. As you know, the state will always fall. If you see how they come out, you'll see a federal number come out, then you'll see a state number come out. Then we might get some localized numbers, but again with the vol the sheer volume it's it's been suspect if those are accurate numbers so um the edc and the chamber just did a survey to employers and one of the questions was have you had a reduction in workforce either temporary or permanent and of those that answered we had about 42% say that yes, they had had a reduction in workforce. Um, now the majority of those answered that they were temporary reductions. Um, some were permanent and some just weren't sure. But right now that's kind of what we have received back from that survey. Yeah. Lisa, not to put you on the spot, um, so don't feel like you have to respond, but being the large employer that's on the call today, is there, um, are there challenges that you're seeing or either through this pandemic or just hiring challenges that you feel like um, the chamber, the EDC, Eastern Indiana Works, any of us can assist with? Well, I mean, to best answer that right now, I mean, the bit, I think all in all, I've been very 
happy um, and, and proud of our, our employees here at Primex. Um, uh, we've maintained working um, and, and had to do minimal um, layoffs um, up until here recently. And so um, we've been very proud to be able to maintain our workforce. Um, now, with that being said, we're not back selling people as we're losing them either right now. So I think our biggest concern is going to be as we start seeing that upswing, um, as the people are getting back to work um, and the orders uh, start coming back in that have all been halted, um, that's where our concern is going to come from is how are we going to find those people? I mean, you address the unemployment um, and having that uh, additional bonus. That's an obvious concern, I think, for most employers. Um, we've got more um, people upset uh, when they did finally have to file unemployment because we were working every other week um, for, I think it affected people for two weeks total. But um, when they would file unemployment and then they saw that they could get the extra and then they were like, oh, well, we could have, <laughs> you know, made close to what they were making while they were working the whole time. And so mm -hmm. that, that was uh, uh, perceived as a negative um, for our company at that point in time. But, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to be concerned as the orders start coming back in and business starts um, coming back to more of a normal to where we're busier and how we're going to um, fill those positions uh, with people and, and also just, you know, helping people stay at ease and comfortable and, uh, what you know, just what the new normal is going to look like for us and for everyone. So I don't have any specific questions, I guess, sure. right now, but I mean, those sure. are our, our concerns, I guess, going forward. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? Senator Rotz, since we have you on the phone, um, I know you've been listening in and, and kind of hearing some of the um, information. Any thoughts that you would like to add or things that um, you're seeing from the State House that maybe are have changed in the last couple of weeks since we spoke last? Oops, you're muted. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks for asking. And, and uh, thanks, Mike and uh, Gus. Uh, I'll get to meet you one day. I'm face to face, I'm sure. Uh, no, um, you know, I, one, a couple of things I'll say. I know uh, us uh, legislators and my uh, peers as well have been spending a great deal of time uh, vetting out uh, calls from constituents because of the, the backlog at DWD. They were obviously bombarded with uh, calls and uh, they've been excellent in responding. Uh, and so I, at this point, I have nothing but good things to say about the process, even though it's taken a little bit longer. And, and of course, people have been on the phone for a long time and so we're doing our best to help vet those things out, and, and uh, um, I'm I'm pleased with the what the governor has done uh, as far as setting the timeline uh, how we open up the economy. Uh, we can always back off of that should things uh, go south uh, with the number of infections uh, or or cases where people maybe have to be in the hospital and that. So. Uh, from an overall perspective of the state and, and personally me, uh, the quicker we can uh, get the economy going, the better off we all will be. And of course, we don't want uh, to lose one person that we don't have to, nor do we want to let the economy lag for one day longer than, than we have to either. And so balancing that out, uh, both at the state level and locally, uh, I think is really the answer. And uh, it's interesting, uh, and I don't know, uh, the uh, HR director from Primex, but you know how this opens up and the, the supply chain getting to the orders from and then the supplies coming. I, I think everybody's probably, uh, I hope, uh, you know, sitting, uh, waiting for those orders, uh, both the ones to get them going and then the materials to supply them. And so uh, we were, we can't be on an island by ourselves either in a lot of cases, right? Uh, when we're ahead of other folks. So uh, yeah, please at what is happening in the community and, and uh, 
Mike, uh, I think you were partially correct in, in saying Gus has been involved. It appears, obviously, he's been involved in workforce for a long time at different levels. And, and so uh, uh, good job, Gus. Uh, and good job for, for all of us, all of you all that are on the line uh, in our community here. Uh, it takes everybody to, to make this happen. So I'm grateful and, and really uh, consider myself blessed to be able to represent you all at the State House. We appreciate what you and um, Representative Barrett and um, Tom Saunders, what you all are doing. And I know it's not an easy time, but we're glad that we have people at the helm that care. And so we appreciate that. Um, and so if I could add, um, yes. no one, uh, in my world is more engaged in um, workforce development than Senator Rotz. He, uh, we talk frequently. He pushes me to be uh, better at what I do with ideas and questions and uh, just want to express my gratitude to him. Thanks, Mike. Well, we are over time, but we did have a little bit of a delay there getting started. So thank you for those of you that stayed with us, got back on the call. Um, and again, we'll be pushing this recording out shortly, but thank you for your time, Gus and Mike and Senator Rotz and the rest of you. And um, if there's anything the chamber can do, ways that we can support you and support our, our um, local workforce, we are more than happy to do it. Thanks. Have a, thank have a great day, everyone. You too, thank you. Thank you.